but the ultimate sort of take home is that you are extraordinarily valuable unit of reality. I mean, it's like there's all these things in the world and all these things to think about. And one of the most familiar things is yourself. And sometimes we take for granted the things that are familiar. Um, but I take it that consciousness really points to the significance of who you are and your powers in the world. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where we're very pleased to welcome Professor Joshua Rasmussen. He is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Azusa Pacific University, and his research focuses primarily on metaphysics, necessary existence, theology, truth, and a number of big and related topics. His books include Defending the Correspondence Theory of Truth, Necessary Existence with Alexander Proust, The Bridge of Reason, Ten Steps to See God, How Reason Can Lead to God, and it's got the best explanation of things with Philippe de Leon. Um, feel free to add anything to that. But um, with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Rasmussen. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I was just telling you before this time together that I really appreciate uh, you gave me some nice comments on an early draft of this next book I'm working on, on consciousness, which we'll be talking about today. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not a problem. Was it really was a pleasure to read it and, and uh, be part of the the process, I suppose, in a little bit <laughs> of a way. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and that and that book, as you say, is going to concern consciousness, but but also um, mental phenomena more generally, um, yes. things related to the self, and and you try to connect these to a sort of broader picture of reality too. Um, yes, that's it. So, yeah, the the goal of the book is to investigate both the nature of consciousness. Um, as it relates to personal beings and then their origin. So the title is, who are you really? Uh, and then the sort of subtitle kind of negotiating it, but it's something like an investigation into the nature and origin of consciousness or of personal beings. So that's the project. And kind of what motivates this is that I'm always interested in understanding the foundations of things like, like what's the foundation of existence, right? Like what's, what's the foundations of mathematics? What's the foundations of science? I think about these things a lot. I even think about what's the foundations of relationships. My wife and I talk about these things, uh, psychological foundations. And so when it comes to consciousness, I sort of think of consciousness as acting as a kind of personal window into the nature of reality. You sort of look within and you can see thoughts, feelings, emotions, and it's kind of a window into elements of reality. And I think this window then can help us to think about sort of the foundations of consciousness and how it relates to reality. So that's kind of my big project there. Yeah, that's that's a great description, and I think I feel like that really comes through. And and I had another sort of general question about the um, about the book. And um, so a couple months ago, I interviewed Larry Temkin about one of his upcoming book. I think it's coming out in a couple of months. Um, the one thing that he was sort of sensitive to is um, trying to make the book both. Um, accessible to a general audience, but also engaging yeah. to professionals. And I, I was wondering to, to what extent this has been um, in the back of your mind and and, and in the front you... of my mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have good eyes to discern yeah. that. Um, you know, and I gave you a very early draft. I mean, the earliness of the draft was kind of embarrassing to even send to you, but you were very gracious, uh, and you, I think, you read it charitably and gave me some helpful comments. But um, but my goal in that draft, I mean, in this project is to reach a broader audience. Like I really want this to be accessible, but I'm still kind of finding my voice even in my edits because I also want it to have a depth, uh, a technical precision. I want it to be the kind of thing that a professional in the field could pick up. Um, I've got some of my own original research on the, the counting argument with respect to thoughts. And I've got some original analysis of some of these things. And so I do want somebody who's familiar with the field to feel like they can read it and get some gems out of it and it can help them. It can serve them, but also in a style that like anybody can come in and sort of own their own journey in a way. This is one of the other goals that I have for the book is I want the reader 
to feel like they can have tools that they can use. And I talk about several different tools that they can use to investigate things from their own perspective, by their own light. So I'll point to relevant science, but there's always this question about how you interpret the science. And I want to show how you can use these tools to investigate consciousness, investigate the science and analyze the science kind of by your own analysis. So yeah, it's, it's it, I am trying hard to have it reach that broad audience without loss of precision, precision. It's similar to my book, How Reason Can Lead to God. That book, I had two general um, people in my mind. One was kind of my former self as like a college student. And then another was a professional in the field. And even as I was doing the edits for that book, I would do a layer of edits while thinking about the college student. And then I would come back and I'd do a layer of edits while thinking about the professional. And so that's kind of what I'm doing now um, in this consciousness book. I'm having both people in mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very good. I think that's, um, I think that's starting to come through as, as you're, as, a, as the, uh, as it's coming together. Um, and one thing you mentioned there was sort of the, uh, the tools that people can use. And um, that's something you talk about early on uh, in, 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 as you're introducing and sort of setting the stage. And I thought that was a, a really way, good way to go about it, right? Like, um, like, okay, what are the, how are we gonna go about this project? What are the things, sort of things that we can appeal to, um, like reason, like introspection and, yes. and, and the scientific method is, are the three main ones you point to. That's right, yeah. But this general idea of like, maybe it's, part of it's about getting on the same page. Like um, when you're trying to make progress on some disagreement or potential disagreement, mm -hmm. getting on the same page on the tools of inquiry and, and certain um, um, sort of background assumptions can be a good way to make headway. So. I don't yeah. know, do you want to talk a little bit about, about um, sort of yeah, things like, you have in mind here? Yeah, I like how you put that um, to kind of help people to sort of get on the same page in terms of how we can even proceed. I mean, it's interesting because in a way, another reason why I want to emphasize these tools, and I'll talk more about the tools in a moment, is that I want to respect the sort of personal journey of the reader. So the reader can read the book and come away with a different analysis than the analysis I come away with using those tools, but I'm trying to kind of model the use of those tools. And I'm inviting the reader to use those tools to think for themselves about the data of consciousness. So one of the tools, for example, is introspection. This is a tool by which we can sort of look within, find thoughts, find ourselves feeling certain things. And I take some time to articulate how I think this tool can work, why I think this tool can be helpful. I don't claim that it's hundred percent reliable, but just that it is a light that we can use. And this tool I think is, is actually required in order to recognize that there is consciousness. So I do talk about the eliminativist proposal that there actually isn't consciousness, or at least there isn't consciousness of certain types. Maybe there's no thoughts or there's no feelings. And it's interesting because we could, we could try to give arguments for consciousness. I was actually just thinking about this again this morning. I was thinking, you know, I could argue that you know, some of my experiences seem more positive than others. For example, happiness seems more positive than, I don't know, like feeling pain. Uh, that's like the first premise. Second premise, if some experiences are more positive than others, then there are some experiences. Therefore, there are some experiences. I think that is a sound argument. But the difficulty is that it, in a way, it kind of begs the question against somebody who's skeptical of the conclusion, because the person who's skeptical of the conclusion is going to ask, well, how do you know? that some experiences are more positive than others, unless you have some tool that can reveal to you that there are real experiences. And this is where I think introspection is a valuable tool. It, it's by the light of introspection. We look within, we detect our, our experiences. And I have some things to say about why I think it's reliable, but I think just setting the stage and inviting the, the reader to take up that tool, apply it to themselves. So in each chapter, I'm taking introspection as a tool. I'm trying to collect some data relevant to the inquiry. And there's a lot of data to collect. I mean, it's not just that you have thoughts or, you know, or that you have feelings, but like, what are the aspects of thoughts that you can discern using introspection? I make the case that you can focus in on a particular thought. Like if I have the thought that there are bunnies or that there are no bunnies, okay? Just take any random thought, focus in on it. And I make the argument that you can actually discern by introspecting that thought, different aspects of the thought, including aboutness, 
including a kind of structure. There's a structure of concepts or structure of a propositional content within the thought, and you can discern this through introspection. And so this is a way in which I think we can get started um, thinking about consciousness. It's using introspection. Then the light of reason is another tool that I invite each person to take up. I take some time to motivate why I think reason can help us to understand consciousness. And that, and again, I'm inviting the reader to use the light of reason by their own analysis. And so in many of the chapters, I, I try to make deductions using reason. But again, I'm inviting the reader to sort of check that, see if that makes sense, or if maybe they have a different analysis. And then the scientific method, I kind of think of that as um, sort of like a general framework or, or methodology for coming up with observations and then coming up with hypotheses to uh, making observations, coming up with hypotheses that we can then see if those hypotheses fit those observations. But again, where do we get the observations from? Ultimately, you've got to use your senses. Introspection is for one of the senses. Um, there's other senses that are relevant. And so I really want to get all the data on the table uh, for the analysis, which makes it hard because there's a lot of data to consider. Yeah, that's that's a very good, bunch of very good points there. And, and, you, and you talked, you mentioned briefly about like, well, what could we give an argument for consciousness um, or against eliminativism, either about phenomenal consciousness or, about, or intentionality or something like that. And exactly. like, my thought is like, well, maybe, but like at the end of the day, we're not gonna, we're not going to convince the skeptic. Maybe not, right? Like, um, there's a game so the you can play. There's yeah. sort of almost a language game, a dialectical game, and, and I actually kind of like that game. I think it, it can help reveal kind of what people are thinking, what's at stake. But I mean, I think in the end, there really is this data that I think you get by looking within, and if if you can't do that. If you can't use introspection to look within, then yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. I think you can't really make an argument um, for consciousness apart from that tool. Right. Um, that, that makes sense to me. Like, and for the, for the person who's just going to continue to deny any sort of consciousness, like, I guess I'm just not going to engage in the conversation with that person. You know, is that sort of what you would say or um, well, I, I'm maybe. not going to say that myself. So I, I like to engage in the conversations. Um, it, I mean, in a sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to engage in the conversation in such a way that highlights why I think we need introspection and why I think introspection can help us, why it's reliable, even if it's not hundred percent reliable. Um, I mean, it, it is interesting, Troy, because I was reading uh, Hasker's engagement with the eliminativists in his book on the emergent self. And I thought it was a very beautiful set of chapters where he's carefully going through this sort of dialectic. Um, and I actually kind of follow him to a point in my own uh, discussion of eliminativism as well. And he talks about this sort of argument against eliminativists that eliminativism is self-defeating because if you're an eliminativist, you're basically affirming or thinking uh, if you're an eliminativist with respect to thoughts, let's say, you're affirming or thinking that there are no thoughts. And so there's this kind of self-defeat objection. But of course, this is very well known by eliminativists. And one kind of response, this isn't the only response, is to give an analysis of our talking and of our acting when we're, quote, thinking about consciousness so that we're not literally thinking in the way that people sort of on the street might think that thinking is, if that makes sense. Um, and so you can sort of avoid the self-defeat in that way. But then Hasker, I mean, it's interesting because he draws this out and he says, well, okay, so we need to replace our references to thoughts or to affirmations. If you're saying you're affirming a limitivism, uh, we have to replace that with something else. That's not literally thinking. It's not literally a mental state at all. But then he kind of has this soft line where he says, well, then I don't really actually know what your replacements are. Um, you know, in your arguments, he sort of highlights these references to mental phenomenon in the arguments against mental phenomenon. So in order to take these arguments seriously, we need to get translations of all these arguments that don't make reference to mental phenomenon. And he's sort of grasping to understand then whether those translations go through. He's not making sort of an in principle argument that there couldn't be translations. But he's just saying, as far as he can see, the translation project 
has not been um, successful or he, he himself doesn't know what's being said then. I kind of appreciate that sort of modest uh, approach. I think that is a way of playing the game in a way. Um, but in the end, ultimately, I do think that really to make progress here, we have to actually just recognize that there's this tool we have to see within. Uh, and so then, then I think the next stage is <clears throat> to consider whether that tool is reliable. So there's, sometimes there's arguments against the reliability of introspection. And sometimes those arguments first try to show that's not 100% reliable. And I like to make my argument without assuming 100% reliability. Um, but then there's arguments about whether it could be reliable to any degree. And my problem with those arguments is I do think those are ultimately self-defeating. I think you actually do need to use introspection to be even aware that you're making scientific observations, to make, be aware of your own analysis of those observations. So that any argument against uh, the reliability of introspection to any degree, is gonna ultimately be self-defeating. So that, that's probably more than what you were asking for, but that's a bit of analysis of there for that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, Cause I, any, any, um, any argument to the conclusion that our introspection or um, perception is like, generally or perhaps universally unreliable is just going to undermine the very argument to that conclusion in the first place, right? Is that kind of the thought there? Yeah, it, that does seem right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's really good. I, I was thinking about, um, it was a few months ago, I talked with, with Keith Frankish and he's sort uh, of eliminated us about qualia, but yeah. um, what he would reject is this more robust notion of qualia and maybe yeah. he would, he doesn't want to deny that we have, um, I don't know, some sort of experiences and some sort, there's some sort of mental phenomena going on there. In some sense. And, <laughs> yeah. But it gets me thinking of like, well, what is it to be like mental phenomena or mental? Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard to give a general account, but I don't know, the sort of stuff that I'm aware of right now, right? The, the experiences, the experiences, the yeah. thoughts and so on. Um, um, is this the sort of thing that I can't, bring myself to deny <laughs> almost as a Cartesian sort of way. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it seems like you're saying some of those similar things. Are... Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. And, and that, and I just want to be careful. That isn't to say that I think that um, one can't sort of rationally defend another model here. I think there, we can learn from exploring other models. And so, like I said, I'm happy to sort of play those dialectal games and not just to play a game, but also to, really see what else I can learn. And I think oftentimes what it, what those projects do is they help to sort of make, help us to see distinctions between different, maybe understandings of consciousness. So probably we're going to talk next about sort of what is consciousness. If consciousness is real, like what is it? And I think that this sort of talk about whether consciousness is real ultimately kind of helps us to distinguish different theories about what consciousness would be if it were real. Because I think that's part of the problem is that there's sort of ideas about what consciousness would be if it were real. And then there's maybe arguments against the reality of those things. And that can then lead to a limitivism. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and I think you made um, some notes of that in, in the book, like Alex Rosenberg has taken an approach like that um, to a sort of a limitivism anyway. With respect um, to aboutness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good point to sort of transition into some of the um, different theories of, of consciousness that you explore yeah. and uh, where you go there. Um, and it, as you're introducing some of the different views, one thing, you know, you have reductive physicalism, you have non-reductive theories, functionalism, you have behaviorism, you have mm -hmm. um, dualistic theories, including substance and property and so on. And um one thing you seem to have in mind is like, well, what um, of some mental state, maybe some pain state, um, what is its true nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about this notion of a uh, the true nature, like, because um, that yeah, might like seem, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, finish your your thought. What might it seem? Do you think um, it might seem a bit mysterious or like um, yeah. unclear what it means for something to be like a true nature? Um, yeah, I could say more, but maybe if you have yeah. any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, th I think if 
if I use that phrase, um, I'm just trying to point to like what it is. Uh, you know, I think of nature as properties of a thing. Um, but it's interesting because nature isn't themselves can have natures, natures themselves can have properties. And so I want to distinguish between the properties of a thing and the, the thing itself. So it might help to just consider an example. Let's just take the feeling of happiness. Um, so right now I'm feeling happy, happy connecting with you here. There's a certain quality to that feeling and I'm now paying attention to it. I'm, I'm attending to that quality of happiness. And so when I'm considering, okay, well, what is that quality? I'm taking myself to, in a sense, be acquainted with the quality itself. So I, in a, in a way, I see what it is um, by that acquaintance. Um, I'm sort of directly acquainted with it. Now I can ask further questions about it. Like, well, is it the same thing as some kind of uh, state in my brain, for example, or is it a, is it a shape or, or is it a, <laughs> a pine cone, right? And uh, those questions, I think in order to answer those questions, I think one does need to start with the data of the experience itself and pay attention to the experience. That's one of the observations that you can make from within. And then in the book, I talk about what I call a direct comparison test. I think that in some cases, you can actually directly compare one thing with another, not always but I give a condition for direct comparison. Um, I take it that in order to directly compare two things, both of them have to be within your conscious awareness, your direct conscious acquaintance. So for example, if I'm directly consciously acquainted with feeling happy, the quality of feeling happy, and then I'm directly consciously acquainted with um, feel, uh, let's say the thought that two plus two equals four, I'm gonna take two mental items. I can then compare those and I can see that they're distinct. Another example would be true and false. I, mean, I think that I can be directly acquainted with these properties and then see that they're not the same property. Um, if instead I'm directly acquainted with uh, a quality, let's say happiness, and then not directly acquainted with something else, let's say like right now I'm not directly acquainted with a pine cone, then I think I can actually infer in another way that the happiness is not the pine cone because there's something true of the happiness that's not true of the pine cone, namely happiness is an object of my direct acquaintance. And so in this way, I, I think we can use a direct comparison test to remove, uh, sort of in that early chapter, one of my goals to remove certain theories of identity. And I'm inviting the reader to just use their own light and consider, okay, am I directly acquainted with triangle? Uh, am I directly acquainted with happiness? If I am, I can compare them. Um, if I'm directly acquainted with happiness and I'm not directly acquainted with triangle, well, then, because I'm directly acquainted with happiness, and that's true of happiness, I'm not directly acquainted with triangle, so it's not true of triangle that I'm directly acquainted with it, then I can then also remove the identity of happiness with triangle. And then you can sort of anticipate how, by using this method, maybe we can arrive at some more significant um, results in terms of carving away certain identity theories. Right. Um which yeah, touches on, on your comments, because your comments were just very wonderful in that you're sort of, sort of what I see you doing is carving um, space for the identity theorist in light of my tests, right? So we could possibly talk about that at some point if you want. Yeah, sure. Um, I found this part very interesting, if a bit... Um, um, Maybe I found room for, for some pushback anyway. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> like um, the first concern someone might have, I probably would have when thinking about the direct comparison test is wouldn't the only things we could directly compare be one experience to another or some number of experiences? Like in, in what sense could we, uh, I mean, I guess thoughts, if those aren't strictly speaking experiences, but we're directly acquainted with them. Um, I think what else it, can we compare? Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to depend on your analysis of an experience. So I take it that experiences have contents. So like there's a perceptual experience right now that I'm having of this room and the screen. And that perceptual experience has contents um, of the experience. I don't really think of the contents of the experience as themselves experiences. And I think of them as contents of the experience. Or another example would be 
let's say the proposition that two plus two equals four. I take that, that the proposition that two plus two equals four is a content of my thought that two plus two equals four, but I don't take the proposition itself to be an experience, even though, and here's the point, even though I believe that I'm directly acquainted with the propositional content. Um, same thing with the perceptual contents. I take myself to be directly acquainted with the perceptual contents. And, um, and that acquaintance doesn't require that the contents are themselves experiences. Does that make sense? So what I'm trying to point to is examples of contents of experiences, like propositions, um, elements of perception that aren't themselves experiences. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this is going to get into, um, I get, we might get this to this later. Um, I guess this is more in chapter four, where you talk about perception mm -hmm. more generally. Um, yeah. um, and in aboutness and intentionality. Um, the thought is, um, yeah, okay, what are the contents of the perception? Well, um, whatever it is, it's, it's not a pine cone. Or, or an actual swirl of sand, presumably, right? So it's something mental or something in, in, in your cognition, if not an experience itself, but something like that, right? <laughs> something well, in your mind going on. So yeah, I wouldn't think that it's um, a pine cone, but let me just sort of draw this out. Um, this book has definitely been on my mind because I've been having dreams where they're lucid dreams and I'm aware that I'm dreaming. And then I began to do consciousness experiments in my dreams. So not long ago, I had a dream where I was like, okay, great. I'm dreaming. I'm seeing sort of imagery of mountains. Let's see if I can manipulate those. And so I'm trying to sort of conjure up new images. And one experiment, I conjured up an image of like a, like a, a square, some, some sort of shape. And then I began to rotate it. And, and then I made a prediction that it's going to like in four seconds, reach the sort of edge of my phenomenal field. And so I'm like counting in my mind as it's like rotating towards the edge of my phenomenal field. So I'm like paying attention to these things. And what I'm noticing is that there's something there. Okay. There's a further question about like what that is. There's something there. I can make predictions about it. We can describe it in different ways. I'm happy to use the term shape, even in my dreams. Like when I'm seeing an entity um, that is like square. I'm happy to say I'm acquainted with squareness, or if it's a swirl of sand, I'm acquainted with the swirl shape. I'm happy to use that language. Um, now, some people might, and this is going to depend on your theory of perception, but it might also just depend on your labeling. So I'm happy to also be sort of flexible with my labeling. Like if somebody wants to say, no, what you're actually acquainted with is not shape. It's, um, let's say, of shape. It's an intentional item that points to shape. Um, well, then I'm going to give my analysis on two paths. So in the first path, if what we're calling whatever that is in my dreams and my consciousness that I'm acquainted with, um, let's just say a triangle shape. Okay. Let's say I call it a triangle shape. Well, then I can directly compare that triangle shape with, let's say my emotion of happiness. And I can see that they're different. Now, let's just say instead that um, the triangle shape is not actually, we don't want to call that shape. We want to call it of shape. We want to call it an appearance of shape. Okay, well, then that's fine. But then I'm manifestly not directly acquainted with shape, but instead I'm directly acquainted with of shape. So now I can still use the, uh, the other comparison test where I say, look, here's something outside my direct acquaintance, shapes. Um, by the vocabulary that I'm using, all that I'm acquainted with is the of shape not the shape itself. So the shape itself is outside my acquaintance, mm. whereas my feelings are in my acquaintance. And so now I can see that they can't be the same thing. One's in my acquaintance, the other's outside my acquaintance. So in other words, on either path, I have an argument against identifying the conscious feeling of happiness with the shape, uh, whether we call the thing of shape or whether we call it shape itself, whether it is shape, whether you know, wh wh whether it's a matter of vocabulary or, or a matter of nature, we still, I think, have two different paths that just give us the same result. Does that make sense? What do you think about that? I'm actually curious. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the first thing I would say is that on, on my view, you having, you're having a certain experience or be, maybe it's a dream or maybe it's an everyday experience. 
And um, you can say things about that experience. Um, yes. Perhaps one thing you would say is that it, it looked to you like there was a triangle there. Um, I, I want to say something like, if there's nothing triangular in the world in front of you, so to speak, there wasn't a triangle there in any sense. Um, so I guess that's the more like the of shape view or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Of triangle. Yeah. Um, no, that um, makes sense. But yeah, you had the judgment that there was a triangle. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, yeah. That makes great sense. I mean, and, and that would be the path and the vocabulary that John Searle uh, takes in his book is a book that you re referred me to um, as a great book, Seeing Things As They Are, I believe. Is that, is that the title? Yeah. And um, and he talks about, it's, it's interesting, he's got this section where he talks about not shape, but color. And he, take, and he labels the qualitative color that is the content of your perceptual experience. He labels it. Uh, I think he's using the color red. He I forget his labels like blob or something or glob. He has some word to label that. And then, um, and then he thinks that what it's pointing to is red. But the red that it's pointing to, which is like a wavelength of light or some kind of causal property, is outside your direct conscious acquaintance. And so he separates the contents of your awareness from the objects of your awareness. And he would say that the contents of your awareness are pointers to the objects of your awareness. And I'm happy with that language. We can use that language. Um, and so then I'm going to just articulate my argument in terms of making a distinction then between the objects of awareness that are external to the contents of awareness, and then verifying the distinction between the objects and the uh, conscious contents or, or the, the, the contents that are contents of consciousness. Just, just to be very clear, it's not that the contents have their own consciousness. Right. Hey, right. yeah. Yeah, good. So in this case, how are the, how are we then performing the direct comparison then? Like what things are we comparing? So in this case, what I would say is that you can't directly compare the external object with the internal mental state. Um, right. But that's actually enough to show that they're different because the one is internal and the other is external. So it's kind of a different argument. It's just saying, you know, it's kind of a law of non-contradiction here. It's like if, if something's internal to your conscious acquaintance, then that which is not internal to your conscious acquaintance can't be the same thing as that which is internal to your conscious acquaintance. Ah, uh, uh, I see what you're saying, right. So, okay, so if they were the same, then if one of them is accessible by direct acquaintance, then the other one would be too. Yes, absolutely, you're yeah, yes. Um, so I wanna say, okay, it's, this is gonna turn on exactly um, what it means to be accessible by direct acquaintance. And I think this is something you go into, uh, you talk about the water H2O example in, in the book. Um, if, because I wanna say something like, um, well, of course my mental state is um, accessible by direct acquaintance. Um, I can sort of um, introspect on it, mm -hmm. but that doesn't require that I'm able to introspect on all of its qualities. Yes, that's true. Well. But wouldn't that, so take some quality that it has that I'm unaware of by introspection. Yeah. Um, the fact that I'm not aware of that property, but I am aware of it by direct introspection, wouldn't that be enough to show that they're distinct? Or are you going to say that, that that's a different attribute, but it's not identical with it? Or Yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're anticipating, right? Yeah. So yeah. I would think of that as a kind of dual aspect, which actually I'm, I'm happy with that. I mean, I do think that um, there are neurological aspects like in the real and they're related to uh, phenomenological aspects and of course there are deep questions about how they're related um but i, I so I'm, I'm sort of going slowly step by step consciousness is real here are some identity theories that i want to remove and i actually think that you could probably follow me along this path to a point you know um and may, maybe you could even follow me along enough to enough of what I want to say in the book for my, my broader purposes. Um, because my broader purposes, you know, I'm not just ending with the nature of consciousness. Um, I'm talking about what's the thing that has the consciousness and what makes that right. And, and even if there are aspects of consciousness uh, that can be characterized in terms of neurological states, and which I think is, is true. Um, I, I do think there are neurological states that, can 
are deeply related to consciousness and you could even say that there are aspects of consciousness. Um, that's still going to leave on the table these deeper questions about how you assemble a conscious being. Yeah, yeah, very good. I, um, our time I is feel like that is that. Yeah, I feel like we, we were kind of making good progress here in terms of distinguishing some of these yeah, uh, issues sure. here. For sure. Um, uh, we could talk about that a little bit more, or there's a lot of other things that I, I want to get to. So um, totally up to you. Um, but this may come back up because um, I, I guess it's sort of, yeah. So I think we could talk a little bit about, um, I think this is the third chapter where we go into talk about thought and, um, and you talk about the um, counting argument. And actually it's a sort of series of arguments now. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the version I think it's the third version that you present here is sort of a, a new version. Um, yeah. It do you is. want to sort of talk about that briefly? Or? Uh, well, well, I think it might be helpful to sort of lead into it here. So um, one random morning, I think I tell this story, one random morning, I'm having a bowl of cereal. I think it was Rice Krispies. <laughs> and I was just like thinking about consciousness. This was early in graduate school. And I had this picture in my mind of a sort of mountainous landscape representing material states uh, and those states can be rearranged in different ways. And then overlaying the mountainous landscape, there was a kind of conceptual map about the mountainous landscape. And this conceptual map would signify thoughts. And it sort of just occurred to me sort of in the seed form that there are more ways of combining thoughts by logical relations like or or and well, how do you even know there are logical relations? Well, this is one of those things you got to use introspection. I mean, logic itself can't even get off the ground without these logical relations. And we only know about them, I think, just by introspecting thoughts and seeing the logical relations between contents of thoughts, between propositions. And even if you look on a page and you have sentences, we have to interpret those sentences. And so I take it the sentences express propositions, which are contents of thoughts. So in any case, there are different theories about how this works, but you can see these logical relations in your mind. And so then I had this idea that if there are more ways of combining thoughts by logical relations, then we can argue that there can't be a reduction from thoughts to material brain states. There can't be a one-to-one -one relation. And so this ultimately gave rise to a series of counting arguments uh, where first I made the argument that there can't be a reduction from um, all kinds of mental properties, specifically uh, aboutness properties or thought properties, and then material estates. And then there were some iterations where I began to see how this actually has ramifications for the origin of thoughts. And my latest published iteration in an article, How to Build a Thought with Andrew Bailey, is one where we deduce, I would say, some very surprising consequences from some initial, because we call them axioms, um, but sort of initial um, statements about thoughts and how they can be about other things. And one of the things that we deduce is that we can't, it's like if there are more thoughts than brain states, more possible or conceivable thoughts than possible conceivable brain states, then there's a problem with having a one-to-one, -one, not just identity, but also derivation from, so you, for each thought, you can derive that thought by a unique brain state that determines it. Now the argument's actually very technical. I don't have it memorized. I mean, I had to go through step-by-step right. step to make the deduction. And let me just say that the deduction was so surprising. One of the early uh, referees, they, so it took some time to get that proof verified and worked out. But one of the early referees said that they would be so, they thought it was so significant. They didn't think it could be proven. Um, and then, and so they rejected the paper. <laughs> they, they, they didn't think it could be proven. So then we got the proof checked. We tightened the proof. There were some technical things that needed to be worked out and the ref saw those. Um, and then once we got it proven, well, then the question is, well, are the axioms true? So in the book, yeah, I had a further development where I was thinking again about how do I translate these axioms and translate the proof in a very common, ordinary way. 
And I'd be like working out at the gym, just like thinking about this and, and things started to simplify and to clarify. Uh, and so that's where I came up with this sort of final iteration in the book where those axioms are ones that I think that you can support them by inspecting the nature of thoughts. Um, so I'm gonna have to look again at, at the axioms. I think one of them yeah. is that, you know, if, if you have uh, the, the sort of the identity of aboutness. So like if you have um, thought A and thought B, if they're identical thoughts, then they're about the identical things. Uh, at least the internal contents of the thoughts are identical. If they're identical thoughts, then they're identical things. And that would be like one of the axioms, which you might even think follows from the law of non-contradiction or a law of identity. Um, and then another axiom, which is critical, is that um, for any uh, non-thoughts, uh, there can be a thought about those non-thoughts. At least there's no sort of logical inconsistency in defining a thought about those non-thoughts. And, <clears throat> and that's what gives us the counting premise. So we can deduce via Cantor's theorem that there are more logically possible thoughts than logically possible um, microphysical states that are not themselves thoughts that might generate thoughts. And so that's a very technical argument. I'm not doing justice to it here. I'm just kind of pointing to the different elements of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I found it very interesting. Just uh, one thing on what you just said, though, um, how if, what was it, if two thoughts are identical, then they must be about the same thing or things? Yeah, if A is one of the, numerically one of the same thought as B, then the uh, internal content of A um, would be the same as the internal content of B. Yeah, so it's, that's contentious though, I think, because I think a lot of people would want to say that um, two different thoughts can coincide on, like some people use the term narrow content, um, but maybe differ in terms of broad content or what it is they're about. So for example, the thought that, it seems like we could both have this, the same thought, like I am in pain. Well, because we, because we're using an indexical there, we're going to pick out different things. Sure, but, sure. In terms of the narrow content, isn't it the same? Or um, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, yeah. So I think the distinction between narrow content and broad content is helpful here um, because, you know, this is debatable, but you might think that, um, you know, two thoughts are um, about different things, um, but they're actually not two thoughts. They're actually one of the same thought. It's like, well, what are you actually saying? I mean, is that, isn't that just a contradiction? Well, you might reply, now, what's actually going on is that the contents are the same in their narrow contents, even, even if they're different in their broad contents. And just to sort of illustrate the difference between narrow and broad content. Um, so right now I'm just thinking about my wife, Rachel. Um, there's contents that I can, that, and I would even say I'm directly acquainted with sort of the narrow contents of the thought about Rachel. That's how I know that it's about Rachel is because I'm directly acquainted with its narrow content. Um, but then there are external factors that define as broad content having to do with the thoughts causal relationship to Rachel. You know, what if uh, Rachel's annihilated and she's replaced with a twin and I don't know the difference? Well, then my thought about Rachel and I see her again, I'm having thoughts about the new person I'm seeing. Externally, I'm causally connected to somebody else. It's actually a different person, but internally, there may be no difference at all. So the internal content would stay the same. Um, so the premise the, there, the identity premise is uh, focused on the narrow content. Uh, and it's a very modest premise, just saying that if thoughts A and B are one of the same, numerically one of the same thought, then they have to have the same narrow content. In fact, I sort of think of it like the narrow content is, is what identifies that thought from another thought. You know, what makes the thought that snow is white different from the thought that there are pine cones. Well, the narrow contents of those thoughts are sort of distinguishing those thoughts. That's what makes them different. Right. Yeah. 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 Th that, that seems right to me. It, it seems people dis disagree. Like, well, how should we individuate thoughts or meetings or other stuff like that? And yes. Um, in terms of, I think I'm on the same page, like 
the narrow content, the, the sort of stuff that um, is what you mean by it, as far as you can tell, like the sort of stuff that's psychologically accessible to you and stuff like that. Um, yes. That's how I would want to indiv individuate them. Um, but I was just worried about going from, well, if two, if two thoughts have the same narrow content, then they're about the same thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And I would like to make that yeah. distinction as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like distinctions, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I feel like yeah. kind of what I appreciate about this conversation is that um, a lot of the work in consciousness studies seems to turn on making very fine distinctions. And I just don't think I can overemphasize like how important the carving of distinctions is. I see so much talking past each other. Um, and and, and, and I, I do this too, you know, I'll be saying things, I'm not making certain distinctions. And I just find that by carving the distinctions, we make so much more progress before we get into an analysis, or maybe this is part of our analysis, than we do even by trying to marshal arguments. Um, I think a lot of development and progress can be done just by paying careful attention to separating one thing from another. I certainly see this in the neuroscience of consciousness, um, thinking about, for example, functionalist analysis of consciousness. Well, there's a difference between role functionalism and realizer functionalism and other distinctions as well. And a lot of times these things all get conflated into one. And so you have somebody arguing against functionalism, but they're not actually arguing against all the different versions. And you have somebody arguing for functionalism and they're not actually seeing all the distinctions. So one thing I really want to do is just slow this down and make these distinctions. And so, yeah, I just wanted to make that note because I don't think we can really overemphasize the value of carving these distinctions. Yeah, that's that's a very good note. And um, let's see, I had a couple other things on the counting argument, but I'll just give one because I want to have time for some other things. Um, well, one, in the latest iteration of the argument you give um, where you lay up the axioms and it's a bit, um, uh, it seems a bit more clear um, to me how the reasoning is going, although probably all the arguments are good. Um, the, the third axiom is one concerning uniformity. Yeah. We try to argue from, essentially you're trying to bridge the gap from, okay, thoughts aren't necessarily material states to therefore they they never, they never are material states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that I found a little bit contentious. I mean, because it's going to depend on what we think it is to be a thought. So for example, if someone had a broadly functional account of what a thought is, um, for, yeah. or for something to be about something out, something else, mm -hmm. and they think of it in terms of, you know, I talked with David Papineau and he's, Part of his thought is that like um, intentionality, he was, he was thinking in, in principally in terms of per about perception, but this could be generalized. Um, one of the key features is, is these like sort of systematic correlations that obtain between um, things. Um, he has this whole Tilo semantics thing that adds on to that, yeah. but, um, but the, the, the correlations that develop is kind of central to how um, the mental state or the perception becomes to be about something else yeah and maybe we, this would have to be developed further but if someone had this sort of view and thought that okay um different sorts of things be they material things or non-material things or whatever could in principle come into those relations yeah. well why would it have to be uniform right do you get the the thought that i'm maybe having there yeah um so here i also want to make some distinctions um, well, let me just kind of tell you how I'm thinking about it. And then you can sort of come back and see how this connects. Um, so, I, so I'm, I'm sorting some different thoughts. So one thought I was having was just kind of a stray thought was that I don't actually think that functions themselves are material. <laughs> so, you know, um, which is okay for materialism, broadly speaking, but I think of functional as functions themselves is analyzed in terms of, uh, propositions or ordered sets which we can understand actually, I think in terms of propositional entities, which are themselves contents of thoughts. And so it's sort of interesting how even functions themselves sort of lead us back to thoughts. But okay, let's put that to the side. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about it like this. 
I think it'll help to have some examples. So let's say that I'm having the thought that snow is white or there are pine cones. So that's like a disjunctive thought. And then I have this other thought that snow is white or there are pine cones or there are fish. Okay, and that's another disjunctive thought. And then I have another disjunctive thought that adds some more disjuncts. Maybe we change one of the disjuncts with another disjunct, like that the moon is made of cheese. And so now I'm, I'm sort of cataloging some thoughts in my mind. And somebody, and so and let's just say that my argument, um, the first part of the argument establishes, or the conclusion is right, that, um, that, that um, not all thoughts reduce, not all possible thoughts reduce to material states. Okay, so let's say that that's right. So I'm cataloging these thoughts, and it turns out that... Um, one of them is just not material. So maybe it's the thought that there are pine cones or there's cheese. That's the immaterial thought. But then the thought that there are pine cones or there's blue sky, um, that one turns out to be material. That's a material thought. That, that would be a break in uniformity. I, I take it that that um, is, is implausible because that the just merely changing the contents of a thought is not going to suffice for changing the categorical nature of the thought. Now, it might be that this is incompatible with certain functionalist, functionalist theories, but it might be not. It might be that instead, this is where we come back to distinctions, um, that you could have different kinds of things that could realize whatever sort of functional analysis is, is required for having the requisite thoughts. So it could be that, um, you know, maybe physical beings could have thoughts that aren't reduced to material states and angelic beings could also have thoughts that aren't reduced to material states. Um, that's completely consistent with my argument. So I think that would kind of, I think, do justice to the idea that what the functionalist want, wants to say is that you can have different realizers of the same function even if the functions themselves are categorically uniform, or even if the nature of the thoughts themselves are categorically uniform. Now, there might be something else you're pointing to because in your comments um, on my earlier draft, you were asking me about this, this argument that I gave where I was distinguishing between what I called a kind of reductive functionalism and a non-reductive functionalism. The non-reductive functionalism is sort of leaving open the realizer for the functional uh, states. Um, but I was concerned with the sort of reductive functionalism. And I was making this argument that if angels, let's say if immaterial beings like an angel, for example, could have the thought that two plus two equals one, and then you could have the thought that two plus two equals one, let's say you're a physical being. Um, and if the, the, the thought itself being the thought that two plus two equals one, that general thought is shared between the two, okay? Then there's a question about whether that's a wholly material thing or not. If it's a wholly material thing, then presumably then the angel wouldn't have that thought. So it would be impossible for the angel to have that wholly material thing. Um, and so this is sort of a reason to think that the reductive functionalism is not going to allow these immaterial, wholly immaterial beings to have thoughts. Um, but all of this is consistent with my general counting argument. My general counting argument is actually, actually, I think, pretty flexible in terms of the realizer. So far in the argument, I'm allowing that could be a material realizer, material being that has these non-material thoughts. Yeah, a bunch of good points there. On the reductive functionalism, is, is, that, is someone who endorses that thesis just saying that the only realizers of that function that in fact exist are material? The way I'm thinking about it is, is that it's, it's that all the realizers, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, the nature of the property is a function defined by uh, inputs and outputs. And so, and it's a I say it's reductively material if all the inputs and outputs are material. Um, and so this will cut across all possible inputs and outputs because this function is defined by the inputs and outputs. Okay, so they're, they're saying that, that nothing else could um, 
satisfy those inputs and outputs, but yes. material things or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a consequence of, of it. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that sort of view, um, I would tend to agree, right? If the nature of um, the notion of thought, even if it's a bit, um, a bit vague, we have some sort of criteria in terms of contents and so forth. That doesn't seem to require that the thing which has that thought is um, uh, some material state. Um, and although I wouldn't say quite the same thing for the phenomenal states, because I think we token those in a different way, but that's a totally different thing. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, I think I'm on the same page there, but I definitely still would want to leave it open that um, that a thought could be a different thing, and maybe in some worlds you have where you have um, no physical things, whatever that would be. Um, maybe those things have states that we would call thoughts, or they would call thoughts. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, the, maybe you, you know, the, the difference between the realizer of the thought and then the the thing that the thought is. Right. So, I mean, I would just want to make a distinction between saying that um, an immaterial thought could that very immaterial thought could be a material thing versus saying that that very immaterial thought could be realized by a material state. And at least I just want to make that distinction here and, and just note that the county argument um, allows for there to be material realizers of immaterial thoughts. Yeah, but. But, but it sounds like you, you want to maybe say something stronger. Like you want to say that the immaterial thought could be material. Well, I, I'm not even sure that I want to say that there is this thing, the, the thought, you know, like there are various thinking things that, you know, have various thoughts, token thoughts. Right. And mm -hmm. we have sort of um, um, universals or general categories under which different token thoughts fall right types of thoughts maybe and we're individuating them by contents or something but there isn't another thing the thought over and above the token thoughts or those categorizations if you know what i mean yeah no that's um, a helpful way to put it the way that i would think about it is we could talk about a property being a thought that two plus two equals four and so there can be infinitely many possible token realizers of that property or instantiators of that property. And then you could sort of think of my counting argument as providing an analysis of that general property, the property of being a thought that two plus two equals four. Right. And if the point is that um, this actually gets back to um, something that's come up with uh, Another guess, although I, I didn't talk with him very much, uh, Akhil Bilgrami, and it's like, is the thought now, um, looking at the properties, is that a physical, a material property or an mm -hmm. immaterial property? Right. And there it gets a little bit unclear because, um, well, what is it to be a physical or material That's property? It. Yeah. Like, for, for example, um, it, suppose I say that there's, um, I don't know, three things on my desk. Um, well, okay, is the, my desk has the property of having three things on top of it. Um, is, is that property a physical or material property? I mean, it's potentially realized by things that aren't physical or material, right? Um, in that sense, I guess not. <laughs> or I, the, I, but it's weird to say that I'm committed yeah. to like all these, like some non-physical things, if, even if the, the desk and the room was all that existed. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm totally with you. And I think a lot of this has to do with vocabulary. Right. Uh, you know, and I've been thinking about, you know, what, what are good terms to use? You know, do I want to just talk about, um, you know, brain states and how do I think of those, right? Um, in my first counting argument in that chapter, I do it in terms of shapes. And so I sort of focus in on shapes. Um, and I think that's important in its own right, you know, just to think about like, well, you know, our uh, thought property is reducible to shapes. Um, and then if not, can you derive thought properties from shapes, you know, especially because if you're thinking about kind of what is the, the base, uh, of reality and what are its properties? And then is that base reality able to generate, uh, all the other properties. And so part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort properties. Um, and I'm trying to say, okay, well, whatever thoughts are, whatever phenomenal consciousness is, we can say at least some things 
about their natures or about what they are. And I think it's possible for people to say at least some things about what they aren't, you know, and then we can go from there to say, okay, once we've sort of cleared the path a little bit here on both sides, then we're positioning ourselves to be a little bit more powerful, to have a little more information when we come to the origin question, what kinds of realities could generate um, consciousness? How does consciousness arise? And, um, and, you know, this will lead to various problems, our problem, the identity problem, the combination problem, and other problems. And those problems, I, I think even understanding and appreciating those problems turns on the, the ideas we have about the nature of consciousness and how it relates to other properties. So, yeah, I'm totally with you that even using the term physical, it's, it's a term of art, you know, I mean, on some broad definition of physical, you know, it's, it's something that scientists can investigate in principle or something. I'm happy to say everything's physical on that broad, broad sense. Um, but once we get a little more precise, especially when we get precise in ways that are relevant to our questions about consciousness, then I think that we can make some progress by, well, you know, one thing that I do in the book, and this, this is been something in, in my more recent drafts that I've emphasized is instead of even talking about material things or physical things, I talk about mindless things versus mental things. Because one of the big questions for me is whether reality is fundamentally mindless or, or whether it's fundamentally mental, if, if, if it's fundamentally anything. Um, and I think it's almost helpful to even sidestep the question about whether it's fundamentally material. Maybe it is fundamentally material and mental. Um, you know, maybe it's fundamentally immaterial and mindless, right? So, um, but what I'm interested in is whether mindlessness can be an ultimate foundation of our consciousness. That's kind of the deep question that I'm, I'm, I'm exploring in this book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, as an aside, I'm somewhat skeptical of this notion of fundamentality altogether, but <laughs> that's a whole other um, big topic. Um, or at least, you know, something that doesn't have a further explanation in terms of other states. Um, of course, one could argue that there's an infinite regress all the way out, but I'm thinking in terms of um, sort of our current reality. I'm not even thinking about infinite, the infinite past. I'm just thinking about our current reality and what is explanatorily prior, the mindless or the mental. Um, you know, I mean, I guess you could argue that it goes, it, it switches. There's, there's a mental state that causes a mindless state that causes a, a mental state all the way out to infinity. But then you can still ask about the whole infinite regress. Like, does it have an explanation? If it not, then I would say the infinite regress is in some sense itself fundamental, just in this minimal sense of having no further explanation. Yeah. Well, well like one of the, um, a couple months ago, I talked with Jonathan Schaffer and he has this very view, cool. Yeah. yeah hit, well, he has the priority of the whole, right? Um, and uh, priority monism. And, and um, to him, okay, the whole cosmos is, is fundamental. Um, uh, is that, would, would that be like compatible with your view? Are you, are you going to say it is so? yeah. absolutely. It is compatible with my core thesis. Um, in fact, uh, a number of philosophers have made the argument that, uh, in, in, you know, historically, right. That if the whole is prior to the parts, the cosmos is part of the parts, we can actually make sense of that in terms of mentality, organizing the parts. Uh, you know, I mean, you might even think of organisms as sort of paradigm cases where if anything is a whole that's prior to its parts, it would be um, conscious beings, conscious organisms. And so although my theory doesn't sort of require uh, Schaefer's priority monism, I'm happy to take it on board in the sense that it's fully consistent with my core thesis. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And that sounds very, maybe that's similar to um, uh, Bernardo Castro's view. I think you're familiar with yeah. That's right. And, uh, this sort of idealistic view. And um, I was going to say something else, but it's in my mind. And it doesn't have to be in terms of idealism necessarily. It's just the sort of fundamental mentality thesis that mind is sort of fundamental to reality. And then everything else can be explained and derived in terms of mental operations. And yeah, that, that's consistent with a wide range of options, including priority monism, panentheism, pantheism, classical theism. Um, even panpsychism. Um, and so I think it's, it's helpful to sort of see that 
there's like this core question about like, which is prior, like the mindless or the mental. And, and then to sort of think about a range of options within those two, those two broad options. Yeah. Yeah. I thought of what, of what I was going to say. You, you mentioned um, how the, the mental being a, a good candidate for something where the whole is prior to its parts in some way yeah. or determines its parts. And that's something I think you talk about um, to some extent on the, in, in a section on, on personal identity um, as well yes. later on. Yeah, pretty much all we've been looking at is, is the first section of the book. Uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, so the first section, just for the audience, is devoted to sort of the nature of you. So what are, what are the elements of, of, of you? You've got thoughts, feelings, um, talk about your value, talk about free will, which I guess we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then the second section of the book is about the, the origin of you, like what kind of materials could produce such a being as you? And so that's how I divide the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, um, it's a good structure, I think. And, and, on, on, Thank you. Free, and on free will, um, it's a very difficult topic. And, um, and I mean, you can only talk about it so much <laughs> the literature yeah. is gigantic, but um, I found your view sort of interesting in the sense that you want to, and this is some a recurring theme of the book is that you kind of want to flip the script. Um, the, yeah. the mental stuff isn't determined by or based on or um, um, the mindless. <laughs> based on the mindless in some way. Yeah. yeah. And you think that, or at least seem to gesture toward the idea that these problems concerning free will, um, determinism and, and the problem of indeterminism and so forth, yeah. seem to require or be more of a problem, at least for the for that mindless frame yeah uh but less of a problem for the for if we think of the mental first frame um it wasn't exactly clear to me how it would be less of a problem because we could still ask well okay it's it's mental but is it determined is it not like sure there, there can still be questions there could be threats to free will for example if it's determined and if you think freedom requires indeterminacy that will still be a threat um to freedom even if the mind comes first i think what the mind coming first does is it lets the agent be in the driver's seat. Uh, so what, one way of thinking about this is imagine you sort of look out your window and you see that there are all these strings um, pulling people's arms and limbs, you know, and, and, and you see some people up, uh, some beings like pulling the strings, you know, making everybody do, do what they're doing. Uh, well, in that case, it seems like the people aren't really in the driver's seat. They're not the ones causing their actions. You know, you, we don't have the source condition for agency being met where the person is the source of their action. But I mean, certainly you're right. The source condition is not the only condition. Um, I make an argument that I do think that free will is going to require some kind of choice. I try to be as modest as I can in terms of whether choice precludes determinism. Um, but I do think that one can then use introspection and witness oneself uh, making choices and doing things. And so, and I take this evidence very seriously. This follows the sort of theory of perception, the window theory of perception, which is that I take it that at the core of our ability to perceive things is this power of acquaintance where we can actually, through a sort of window of acquaintance, see some aspects of reality, at least aspects within ourselves and I take it that one of the aspects within ourselves is our ability to form intentions, to, to think, hmm, what do I want to do? And then form an intention and then act on that intention. And so I think that if mindless things, or even if minded beings were pulling the strings on my behavior, um, then I would be a puppet of other things external to myself. And so then I wouldn't be free. Yeah. Yeah. It's a a lot of that makes sense. I mean, the way the way I tend to think about it, at least roughly, is that I don't know. There's there's different things that we might mean by free will, and I think sure. a lot of the time people are talking past each other. But minimally, at least, like, okay, you have some um, deliberation, you have some intention that forms, you act on the basis of that deliberation intention. That seems yes. to be enough to me, right? That's enough for something good. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah. I mean, if 
some people wouldn't want to call that free will, or at least they want would want to make sure. Well, okay, were there genuine alternative possibilities? Were the right, ultimate right. source of your act? You know, um, I maybe, um, and to the to some extent, I would want to maybe I'm say that I'm just just uh, having a verbal dispute with those with, with those people. But yeah, um, I don't know. I, I seem to think about this those sort of things as in the general case, at least sufficient for, for, for a free choice, but um, I hear what you're saying. So what, what you're suggesting is that uh, the sort of principle of real alternative possibilities, as well as even the real source condition may not be sort of essential to sort of your sort of core notion of, of a free will. Right. Yeah. And some people would want to say, okay, that's too weak of a core notion to, yeah. Yeah. for what we want out of it but yeah and that may just be a verbal dispute i mean sort of in the end the question that i have is uh, whatever we want to call it like um you know are we a source of our actions like do we make decisions you know is that true and if that's true is that something that we can sort of witness ourselves do, do is there any evidence for that um and so those are the questions i'm trying to address in that chapter i think you know you're right that kind of my my big take home is not that indeterminism is true or that determinism is true or that free will. You know, I don't see that the root problem of free will is about the determinism and determinism, um, or at least one of the major roots I think has to do with whether things external to you are ultimately pulling all the strings on your behavior. And I think that, that does seem to me to be sort of a metaphysically robust threat to a certain concept of certain concept of free will that I think a lot of people take themselves to have. And I, I motivate why I think we do have at least um, some power to choose in those terms there in the chapter. Um, but certainly I agree that you don't have to build in all these different conditions of free will. In fact, I find it helpful to think of sort of free will as coming in different grades. So sort of like a minimal free will, maybe that includes some of the things you mentioned, like deliberation. Um, and then there's like sort of more a higher grade free will that maybe builds in something else, like maybe the source condition and so on. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And then the question is, you know, what do we have and which versions right. are the ones worth having? Um, worth having. Yeah. It's a bit crazy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So there's a few other sections in, in the um, few other chapters in the first section of the book. I know you talk about value, but I did, um, I did actually want to talk about uh, your approach to perception and the way you um, sounds good. Uh, the options you sort of survey and then the, 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 the conclusions you sort of come to um, this kind of ties back to some of the earlier things we were talking about. And um, you end up describing your view as a sort of um, a sort of window, um, the external window um, that we have to the world. Uh, uh, can you get into a little bit of how that um, how that view works? I, yeah, I call it the window theory of perception, um, which is minimally the idea that we're actually able to see things. Okay, and I'm using the term "see" in the broadest sense um, that we're able to gain information about aspects of reality. Um, this is sort of in contrast to a complete phenomenalist uh, picture where you only see things as something else. Um, so let me just draw this out a bit. Um, so let's say that I look out the window and I see the sun and the phenomenalist would say that actually uh, what I'm actually seeing is sort of a picture in my mind and seeing that picture in my mind is sort of my way of seeing the sun. Um, this won't be Searle's view. Searle will say, no, I am actually seeing the sun as an experience, but the phenomenalists are, will go further than that. And they'll say that what I'm actually seeing is um, something like that's in my mind. And I'm not actually, I don't really have a window into the external world. Um, that may be okay in terms of visual perception, but if we take that all the way to the, to the extreme and we say that about like every sense, like including our sense of two plus two equals four, our sense of our own senses, um, then I think we actually close ourselves off from everything, uh, including our own consciousness. And so we're all the way back to the where we started at the beginning of this 
conversation about how do we be you know consciousness is real. So I think at, at some point, there's just some basic act of seeing this primitive, basic acquaintance with aspects of reality. And I take it on, on my view that um, I am able to see in a basic way, uh, logical relations such as and and or, I'm able to see in a basic way aspects of consciousness. And then it's a further question whether some of the contents of my consciousness also exist external to my own mind. You know, that's like a deep question. And I try to leave things as open as I possibly can, but um, I'm happy with the idea that when I look out into the world, I'm actually directly acquainted with some of the aspects that are of the world um, that are external to my own. Well, in, in one sense, they're internal to my consciousness because I'm acquainted with them. They're contents of my consciousness, but they're not merely contents of my consciousness. They're also, let's say, instantiated in objects external to my consciousness. And, um, and so that, that I think sort of fits with what I feel like I can sort of see most clearly. Uh, but I want to be careful about sort of leaping beyond that and saying, okay, what, it, what is the ultimate nature of even the external world, right? So like, is the external world itself part of a universal mind's imagination? Is it sort of based in consciousness, right? Like, in, in my theory of perception, I can't discern that. Like, I, I don't have a theory of perception that allows me to sort of read off of my experiences uh, in inference that tells me that the nature of the things that I see aren't based in, in consciousness. I mean, later in the book, I have arguments for why I think a fundamental consciousness is going to best explain the origin of everything else, um, but not, not just out of my theory of perception. So I call it the window theory of perception just because I take it that there's some things that I actually see it's like the window of perception is open. I'm actually seeing something. And, and I'm happy to say that some of the things that I see, these aspects are even external to my own consciousness. So that would be in contrast with the phenomenalist would say, no, you're only really seeing things within your consciousness. There's nothing that you can see that's external to your consciousness. Yeah, that's a good overview. And that person would be stuck in the phenomenal realm, so to speak. Um, as you say. Yeah, yeah. I uh, mean, like Donald, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, so Donald Hoffman, for example, um, is a physicist he's coming at it from a physic, uh, physics point of view. Um, Lawrence Bonjour, I believe, um, uh, makes a philosophical case for this sort of phenomenalist perspective. Even, even Castro, um, I want to be careful here because he's got ways of translating things, but he, you know, he, he speaks sometimes, he talks about the um, the screen of perception. And so the screen of perception is sort of internal to you. Um, you're not acquainted with things external to you. And um, that, that might be sort of leading in the sort of phenomenalist direction there. And, and I don't think that's necessary. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. When you say that um, in some sense, you're, you become directly acquainted with things in the world, whatever exactly that amounts to. Yes. Um, are those things thereby, I mean, you kind of want to say this, but kind of don't, that they're also a part of your um, conscious experience. Because um, if is you a, want to say that they're not yeah. a part of your conscious experience, then there's things you're directly acquainted with that are outside of your conscious experience. That seems potentially problematic. So what I, what I, this is a wonderful question because it relates back to something we were talking about earlier about whether there's things in consciousness that aren't experiences. Um, and there, what I wanted to say is that there are contents of experiences that aren't experiences, including propositional contents, um, as well as in perception. I think there are shapes that are parts of my perceptual experience or contents of my perceptual experience. Um, so in, in a sense, we could say that the, the shape that I'm acquainted with is sort of internal to my experience because it's that which I'm acquainted with. Um, but it could also be that at the same time, this shape that I'm acquainted with is instantiated in something that's external to my consciousness. It might be instantiated in a cup, for example. The cup really has this shape that I'm acquainted with in conscious experience. And so that's a way in which the thing that I'm acquainted with in conscious experience uh, 
could be um, anchored in a reality that goes beyond my own conscious experience, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, although I want to, on the face of it, it seems like I sort of understand it, but there's details there that I'd want to uh, explore further. Um, but since we're, I don't want to keep you all day, I know you have other things to get to. Um, maybe if we just want to um, wrap up, I, I normally ask um, at the end of the these interviews, um, guess what they think the sort of um, general value of philosophy is, but yeah, maybe if you want to take that, that same sort of question, but um, as it relates to this sort of, exploration into the yeah. this the mind and the self like yeah, what's sure. worth what is that sort of project worth um what's it good for <laughs> yeah no thank you no this has been a lot of fun and yeah certainly there's far more details we could continue going and going because it's not an easy topic you know there's a lot of different pieces a lot of different um considerations to organize um so what i think of the value of this sort of inquiry into consciousness I think there's a number of different things, but I think one thing that I consider very important, and this is where I get very passionate, is that the nature of you and your consciousness, as well as the origin of you, is going to play into the kind of life you live. So, for example, um, I make an argument in the book, and it's based on a lot of the considerations about consciousness, the nature of consciousness, that you have an intrinsic value. And you have a power to choose. And these things, this intrinsic value and this power to choose, I think can contribute significantly to your own sense of, of meaningfulness in your life. Um, but I don't want that sense of meaningfulness to sort of be based on wishful thinking or um, some kind of, you know, hope or something. Um, I would want it to be based on actual perception of reality. And so this is why I, one of the reasons I care about this topic is because I am convinced that studying consciousness leads to a greater vision of the value of the person, um, of, of your value and your powers, you know, the kind of being that you are, the powers that you have. I sort of draw this out at the end. Um, I, I lead towards sort of this um, conclusion that sort of you're sort of waiting as a reader to see, okay, where is this all going? How does this journey conclude? But the ultimate sort of take home is that you are extraordinarily valuable unit of reality. I mean, it's like there's all these things in the world and all these things to think about. And one of the most familiar things is yourself. And sometimes we take for granted the things that are familiar. Um, but I take it that consciousness really points to the significance of who you are and your powers in the world. So, you know, that that's one of the reasons that I think this is a very valuable topic. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree. Um, yeah, I think I think we'll wrap up there. Thanks, thanks so much for being as excellent, you. excellent talking with you and uh, um, getting your thoughts on this book and and just reading it in the first place. At least thank you. Yeah, this is wonderful, fun. Appreciate it. Thank you, Troy.